Thank you, Tracy. Well, last week uh, we started on a little journey to look through the seven churches uh, that we find in the book of Revelation. And I was uh, asked sometime back to uh, do a series on those uh, churches and finally got around to it. But I discovered as we began that uh, you can't start with the seven churches because they don't show up until the second chapter. And we really have to start in the first chapter if we're going to have a little background and know what we're, we're looking at when we get to those. So we began last week and we looked at the, the very opening verses of the book of Revelation. And one thing we discovered there is exactly what it is that's being revealed to us. Now usually uh, when folks uh, study the book of Revelation, and uh, I did this too in the past, uh, we're looking for uh, dates, we're trying to identify various figures and uh, work our way through all uh, the language and the, the pictures of these uh, sometimes strange and terrible creatures and trying to figure out just what's going on. But we noted that that's not the purpose of the book of Revelation at all. And we're told the purpose Right in the opening words, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, it tells us that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the revelation of the person of Jesus Christ to us. So what we're looking for as we study uh, at least the opening chapters of this book is not dates, not times, not uh, different schemes of doing eschatology, but we are looking to see how Jesus is revealing himself to us through this book. And uh, I found it uh, to be quite enlightening and quite fulfilling as I'm looking at the book from that angle because it seems, at least to me, to present a whole different picture. And one of the things I've noticed is that this book that is often uh, approached with trepidation because it's all about these terrible things that are going to happen, opens with wonderful good news about who Jesus Christ is and what he's done and going to do for us. And it closes in the same way. Remember last week we, we read some of the very last verses in the book as we finished. And it closes with Jesus telling us uh, about the wonderful things he has done, is doing, and is going to do for us. And that we are, uh, one of the terms we run into throughout the book is, fear not. And we'll see that this morning. So a little different approach. And today we're going to continue uh, looking into just what it is Jesus wants, to, wants us to see about him in this book. Now we, we talked last week about phenomenological language. You know, that's one of those great 50 cent words. And all, all that means is it's the language of Hebrew poetry where they, they have all of this imagery and things. And you remember we talked about how our Western minds sometimes struggle with trying to wrap around that sort of thinking. Uh, but we will get more and more used to it as we go along. And this morning we're going to see some of that as John actually shares with us this vision uh, that God has given him. So we're going to begin by talking about two distinct groups of people. Throughout the Bible, from the beginning to the end, there are always two groups of people. You've all heard all the jokes about how the world consists of two kinds of people. And then you insert in there whatever it is you're talking about. But that is true. There are only two kinds of people on this earth. There are believers and there are non-believers. That's it. There's not three. There's not going to be three. There's two. Uh, some, some eschatological schemes come up with three distinct groups of people. No, there are two. There are God's people and there are not God's people. And in the scripture, it helps us tremendously if we can always be alert to who God is talking to. Who is the scripture speaking to? Is it speaking to his people? which is the case the vast majority of the time, or is it speaking to those who are not his people? And we're going to find both groups uh, spoken to uh, here in our message this morning. This is key uh, to understanding. Uh, as we see in verse 4 at the very beginning, John to whom? The seven churches. So who is he speaking to? Is he speaking to God's people or not God's people? <laughs> God's people. Yes. Okay. Very good. And we'll keep that in mind, but as we're going to see here in a couple of verses, we'll see the other group of folks in there also. So here's what he says 
to God's people. He says, grace to you and peace. Now, a couple of words that we may not always uh, think about in regard to the book of Revelation. But it, it's amazing to me and hugely comforting that right off the get-go, knowing all this other mayhem and that's going to take place, first thing Jesus wants us to know is we as his people are receiving grace and peace from him. Well, that's huge. That's huge for us. Grace and peace. Just what we need. Just what we want. It's like he's saying this to the seven churches. He's saying, and we'll see this as we get into him, he's saying, hey, churches, I know you're struggling. I know you have problems. I know life is hard sometimes. But here's what I'm offering you. In the midst of those struggles, in the midst of these hard times, I am extending to you grace and peace. That's huge. And this message extends to us today because we are part of the church, aren't we? We're Christ's bride. And he's saying to us, he's saying to each and every one of you individuals out there, myself included, hey, I know you have problems. I know life is hard sometimes. I know it seems like it'd be easier to just maybe give up. But hang in there because I'm extending grace and peace to you. I like that. He's extending grace to us for the things that we struggle with. Now, you don't have to raise your hands, but if I were to ask how many of you struggle with something, probably most of your hands would go up. If I were to ask you how many of you struggle with one or two things that just keep tripping you up over and over and over and over, and probably, if we were honest, all our hands would go up. And Satan comes along and he plants that thought in our mind. He says, well, if you were really a Christian, you wouldn't continually be tripping over that thing, whatever it is. And he puts that thought in our mind and he says, you've asked Jesus a thousand times to forgive you of that. You have no right to ask again. You see? But Jesus says, no. Grace is forever. I'm extending grace to you. So in those things you struggle with, here's my grace. He's extending peace to us for the things without that we struggle with. The circumstances that we, that we may have no control over. He's saying, it's all right. I'm extending peace to you in the midst of those struggles. You know, uh, Paul called it the, the peace that passes all understanding. And that's why a Christian, even though they can be in a crisis, they may be distraught, they may be sad, they may be whatever, but they, can, they have that inner peace that says, yeah, I know in the long run, in the eternal perspective, it's going to be okay. But then we ask the question, consciously or subconsciously, is he really able? Yeah, I know, he says, He's going to be gracious to me. I know he says I can have peace in the midst of my struggles. But is he able to deliver? Well, let's see. Here the second part of uh, verse 4. This grace and peace is being extended from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. And then over in verse 8, he goes on, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So now with a description like that, would you say he is able? See, we have us extended from God the Father, from the Holy Spirit, and from God the, the Son, Jesus Christ. And what we see is he's expressing his eternal existence when he talks about he was, he is, and he is to come. And we, we sum it up, the Greeks summed it up, he's the Alpha and the, Omega, uh, and the Omega, the first and the last letters of their alphabet. He is everything. He is Almighty. You know, it's like when he revealed himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, and he simply said to Moses, I am. 
Not I was, not I will be, but I am. In 1 Timothy 1.12, the verse that I, I quote sometimes when I'm closing the pastoral prayer and the Jonathan Edwards life, life verse, you know, it says, Unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He is the only one that is eternal, immortal, and eternally wise. So yes, he is able. And verse 8 ends calling him the Almighty. Now we talked a little bit about having some uh, Old Testament background. And when I, I read that verse and thought about that verse, the Holy Spirit brought Jeremiah 32, 17 to mind. When we're asking that question, is he able? And here's what, what he says. Lord God, it is you who has made the heavens and the earth. By your great power and your outstretched arm, now what's the end of that verse, nothing is impossible for you. Well, that nothing includes bringing grace and peace into our lives when we need them the most. And in 31.3, Jeremiah, he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. So there's nothing we can do, as Paul put it in Romans, to take ourselves out of his hand. The times may be turbulent. There may be a season of woe, if you will, in our lives. But that's okay. Because he's going to give us the grace and or the peace to deal with it. What a joy it will be to behold him as he really is. As he's revealing himself to us in this great book. Well, what about the second group of people? I mentioned that we see them here also. And, and we find them uh, over here in verse 7. And behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so. Amen. That's the other group. See? One message to the church, and that message is grace and peace. One message to the unbelievers, and that is, man, you're not going to like it. It's not going to be good. So which group do you want to be in? You know, I, I think I want to be in the grace and peace group. I want to be with Jesus. I want to be delighted to see him, not scared to death. Believers and non-believers. Well, they, another thing that I thought was just marvelous as I studied for this uh, message today is we not only find these two groups, and remember for us, this theme carries throughout the whole book. Grace and peace, it's all good. But I found the gospel. Right here in the opening verses of the book Revelation. And you say, well, how do you do that? Look at here, chapter 1. We start in uh, verse 5. We're going to start in the middle of verse 5 here. To him who loves us and has freed us from the sins from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom priest to his God and Father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, you say, how do you find the gospel in that? Well, just look at it. To him who loves us. Isn't that the opening lines of the gospel? There is a God who loves you. There is a God who loves you. John 3.16 For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. So again, in the opening pages of this doomsday book, if you will, we are told God loves you. Now, He didn't just love us in theory. He loved us in deed. Because what did He do? Because He loved us. You read on. He freed us from our sins. So he acted on that love, and he has freed us from our sins. Now, which sins did he free us from? All of them. When Christ died on the cross, every sin you ever committed was in the future, wasn't it? Sure it was. He took care of those. So guess what? He's going to take care of the ones you're going to commit this afternoon, too. 
and tomorrow and next week and 10 years from now, all of them have already been taken care of. You are freed from the bondage of your sin. Now, isn't that the gospel? There is a God who loves you and he acted on that love and has freed you from your sins. I, I think about uh, Luke chapter 4, verses 8, 18 and 19. And you know, that's where Jesus, in the beginning of his ministry, has gone into the synagogue. And he takes the scroll, and he's asked to read. And here's what he says. Now he's quoting from Jeremiah again. So you see, we're, we're always in these Jer Old Testament, New Testament, Book of Revelation, which of course is part of the New Testament. But here's what he says. Jesus has picked up this scroll and he's standing in front of the, the congregation there in the synagogue and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim, what? Good news to the poor. Now that's not the financially poor. That's the poor in spirit. That's those who have a need for Christ's Spirit in their lives. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. That's that freedom from sin we were talking about. And recovering the sight of the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's the message of the gospel. He's loved us and continues to love us. He has freed us from those things that oppress us, that keep us down, that hinder us. And we need to know, when Jesus Christ frees us, it is not a tenuous, temporal thing. It's not like we're walking this tightrope and if we make a mistake, we're going to fall off. No. No. In John chapter 8, verse 36, it says, If the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. In other words, you are completely free. You are free forever. And then one of my favorite portions in John is chapter 6, verses 37 through 39. And Jesus is speaking, and he's saying this about Christians. He says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me... I will cast out if they commit too many sins. It's not what he says, is it? He says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That would be God the Father. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose, how many? Nothing. Nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. You see, once Jesus Christ extends that grace, that peace, that freedom, it's good forever. You know, Peter uses the language of our being sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. and That'd be until the day we step into eternity with, with uh, Jesus. So, be of good cheer. Buck up. Put a smile on your face. Even though all these woes may be coming, God says, I love you. I've set you free from your sins by my blood. He made the sacrifice. We don't need to offer any more sacrifices. He made one sacrifice once for all time. In fact, in, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. Therefore, he, that's Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. There's, see that word eternal again. Nothing temporal about it. Since a death has occurred that redeems, that's Jesus Christ's death on the cross, that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. He has done all that for us. We don't have to worry about it. And then uh, in chapter 10, verses 12 and 14, we read, this is Hebrews, But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. 
And that's symbolic, that's symbolism for in, in their culture. When you sat down at the right hand of the ruler, that meant you had completed your task. It was all taken care of. He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. So Jesus has accomplished all of this for us. He loved us and loves us, so he set us free from our sins by shedding his blood for us and offering that one sacrifice for all time. Now, this is a reason why if you continue to study uh, eschatology, which is just the study of last things, you will find that there are some schools of thought that say, well, at some point, uh, physical Israel has to be restored and the temple will be rebuilt, blah, 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 blah. Why? What was the purpose of the temple? The purpose of the temple was a place for God to dwell and a place for them to offer sacrifices. Are there going to be any more sacrifices? No. It's done. The Jewish system is done. It ended. And now we live under Christ's benevolent reign. Well, let's take a look at John's circumstances. Chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, your partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos. Now, this is important. The reason he was on the Isle of Patmos. On account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, Patmos was a penal island, and they would send troublemakers there. They, they didn't want to make martyrs out of them, so they would just exile them to Patmos where they wouldn't be causing trouble and stirring up the general populace and getting people all fired up. Now, the reason he's there is for doing the right thing, isn't it? Now, you've all been in situations where you probably have anyway. I've been in them a lot of times. Where you've done something wrong and you get in trouble for it. Or there are repercussions for it. Now, that's not so hard to deal with, is it? Because we know we shouldn't have done what we did or we should have done something we didn't do. And now we're reaping the consequences. Well, we can cope with that. But what about when we do something right? When we do the right thing at the right time in the right way and we still get persecuted for it. That's a little tougher to deal with, isn't it? And uh, the, the AM, the Thursday morning men's group, we're doing a little study on the life of Elijah right now. And that's kind of where he's going back and forth through. He, he keeps doing the right thing, and his situation keeps getting worse. And it's so easy at those times to say, well, where is this God that loves us? And that's why John in this verse says, patient endurance. He is patiently enduring. You know, he's such a guy. Such a great guy, this John. And we could be like, look at how he starts out there in verse 9. I, John, now what would I say in that situation? I might say, I, John, one of the original apostles, I walked with Christ. In fact, Jesus called me the disciple he loved. You guys better listen to me. Yeah? No, he didn't say that. He had every right to say that, didn't he? Or he could have said something like, look at me. Look at how I'm suffering for Jesus. You've met people like that, haven't you? You love them, don't you? <laughs> yeah, you just don't like to be around them. I love them too. I don't want to be around them either. But he doesn't say any of that. He says this. He says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation. In other words, I'm just like you guys. I struggle with the same stuff you struggle with. I'm, I'm here just like you're here. We're all doing the best we can. And I, I'd like to draw your attention for just a minute to that word tribulation. Because we, we tend to, again, that's one of those words like apocalypse. We tend to think, uh oh, this is terrible. I'm going to have tribulation. That's got to be some huge, terrible thing. Well, it can be. But the way it's used here, and the way Jesus used it, by the way, when he said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world, it's just talking about the daily ups and downs of life. 
That's the tribulation he's talking about here. Now there's a time of great tribulation, yes, but that's not what we're looking at here. We're looking at just the daily struggles of life. And John says, I'm right there with you guys. I'm struggling right along just like you are. <laughs> I struggle to turn my phone off just like you guys. That's what he's saying. <laughs> now, notice, too, that John is speaking in the present. This tribulation isn't something that's going to come. It's already here, and they're already dealing with it. Now, he, he urges his Christian brothers to endure patiently. You know, we don't like that, do we? I don't like that, anyway. I want it to be over with. Boom. But he says, no, he says, endure patiently. And we'll get through this together because Jesus has extended you grace and peace. Okay, now he's identified himself. We, we kind of know what kind of a guy he is. He's a good, straight-up kind of a guy. Now we're gonna, he's going to relate his vision to us. Uh, chapter, chapter 1, it starts in verse 10. And let, let me read some of that for you. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying. Now, before we move on, the Spirit came to him when he was suffering, right? Because even if they, there, I don't, there wasn't a lot of physical things going on with him, but he was exiled, he's alone, he's on his island, and that's when the Spirit of God comes to him. And I would suggest to you that oftentimes that's when the Spirit of God comes to us. And I think the reason is, those are the times when we're willing to listen. Because when everything's going real good, sometimes we don't listen real well. Because when it's going real good, I tend to kind of wear this arm out here going like this. Boy, I'm doing a good job. See? But when it's going re not going so good, I tend to cry out to God. And that's when he speaks. So here he is. He's, he's on this island, and the Lord's voice comes to him saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sh sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Wow. Quite a picture, isn't it? How, how do we make sense of that? Well, one thing you, you, you can know for sure, when God writes something down, He wants you to know. He doesn't make it so mysterious you can never get it. You see, for, for centuries, that's kind of what we pastor types did and priests and that. You know, we tried to make it so hard to understand that only we could really figure it out. So you guys need us. Huh. No, you don't. <laughs> okay. Now, in this case, uh, the thing we want, he wants us to know for sure is what do the lamp stands and the lamps mean? Well, since he wants us to know, guess what he does? He simply tells us what they mean. And here, if you look over here, verse 20, As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So we've now identified the stars and the lampstands, right? Because of those, that little word, are, right? These are this. That's easy, huh? Anybody can do that. But what about all this other gobbledygook in between? Well, you don't see the word R anywhere, do you? When he's talking about that. But the word you see that you want to take note of is like. He doesn't say these are this. He says they're like this. Okay? Totally different deal. We don't need to identify them. 
We just need to know that it's something grand and glorious. Um, one thing to remember, and I, I think I pointed out to you last week, maybe I did not, but in Dennis Johnson's great commentary on, on Revelation, he says the point John is trying to make is he's not trying to show us what Jesus looks like. He's trying to show us what Jesus is like. You see? And there's a difference. And it's, again, it's hard for our Western mind uh, to grasp. But, um, for instance, when he says from his mouth proceeds a sharp double-edged sword. Well, now we've all, well maybe we haven't all, but a lot of us have seen pictures and paintings, you know, artists' renditions of these things, and they're all pretty, pretty wild to look at. But do you really think that's what Jesus looks like? No. But, but, just maybe Hebrews 4.12 comes to your mind, where it says the word of God is sharp as in a two-edged sword, dividing even to the joints and marrow. Oh, okay, I get it. That's what that sword symbolizes coming out of his mouth. The word of God. And the burning eyes, you know, well, they could be piercing, couldn't they? You know, he's talking about how when Jesus looks at us, I mean, that's kind of scary, isn't it? If we're not, if we're not really on to this grace thing and really understand it, because when he looks at us, see, when, when I look at you, and when you look at me, we see more or less what you want me to see, and you see what I want you to see. I look pretty good. Nice jacket, you know, may, may not be the handsomest guy, but okay, I'm passable. But when Jesus looks at us, he goes to the inside. Uh-oh. Problem. See? Somebody says, I don't remember who it was to give them credit, but they said, if, if you knew me like I know me, you wouldn't like me. And if I knew you like you know you, I wouldn't like you either. <laughs> you think about that. But that's, what Je that's how Jesus knows us. And he loves us anyway. That's marvelous. So when we're dealing with this phenomenological language, we can really fall into a trap, into a morass, mores, if you will, if we try to identify everything with something we understand. And we use phenomenological language all the time. Now, Lloyd's up in Seattle <clears throat> right now. He'd, he'd understand this in a minute. Um, if I were to say the 17th hole at Orchard Hills is like this giant dragon with its mouth open waiting to devour your good golf score. Well, you wouldn't drive over here to Orchard Hills to, with a gun to shoot the dragon, would you? You're expecting to find a real life dragon. But if you've ever played there, you get it. <laughs> you know, because you're sailing along and you've played 16 holes, you've got a pretty decent score going, you only need to get through two more and you're going to have a great day. Yeah. <laughs> and then the dragon gets you. And so much for your great day and the good score, it all goes out the window. See, that's what's happening in the book of Revelation oftentimes. Phenomenological language. Well, okay. What is John's response to all this stuff? Well, verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though I was dead. Whoa, that sounds like grace and peace to me. That's a little scary, isn't it? I fell at his feet as if I was dead. And I thought of Isaiah chapter 6, you know, where Isaiah uh, sees, sees the Lord. And Isaiah's uh, response was this. He says, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I am undone. Wow. That doesn't sound like grace and peace either. Maybe we don't want to see the Lord as he really is. But we do. But you see, this is what happens when we see Jesus for who he really is. And we understand how helpless and hopeless we really are. There's not a one of us that can change our spiritual condition. 
Our only hope is to throw ourselves at the feet of the Savior and say, here I am. I'm hopeless. I'm undone. I can do nothing. The holiness of God is just too much for us to handle at this point in time. But now, a couple of my favorite words. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not. See, just when we think we're undone, we're unworthy to be in his presence, we've dropped the ball once again. He puts his hand on us, says, Fear not. And now he reassures John that he is able. He says, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died and behold, I am forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. He's got it all in his hand. It's taken care of. There's a song years ago, you know, his kids still sing it. He's got the whole world in his hand. And he does. He's the one that determines. He is the first, he is the last. And he can say to us, as he said to John, fear not. Fear not. Now, as we mentioned last week, this message was intended for that first century church. But it's also a message that the church needs to hear through the ages. There was never a time when the church needed to hear this more than the mid 1500s. You know, the Reformation had taken place. England is a power. A uh, king you all have heard of is, uh, is uh, ruling England, Henry VIII. Okay? Henry VIII breaks from the, from the Catholic Church because he wants to divorce Catherine of Aragon. And of course, the Catholic Church won't let him do it. So he breaks from the church. And Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, agrees with him. It defends his position. And breaks from the church. And several other very notable people did the same thing. Hugh Latimer and Ridley. And they were both pastors. And they preached against Catholicism. And they did it vociferously. And that was great as long as Henry was on the throne. But Henry, as all men, eventually died. And Edward VI, his son, took the throne. But Edward was, uh, Edward was kind of a wimpy little guy. And he, he just wasn't up to it. He, he was good with being a Protestant. But he just wasn't much of a guy. And somehow he mysteriously died. Well, that should have brought Lady Jane Grey to the throne. But there was this ominous woman over here by the name of Mary. And you know her as Bloody Mary. And she earned that moniker, by the way. Now, John Knox over in Scotland wrote a book and about to her, actually it was to her, and he titled it, uh, The Last Blast of the Trumpet for the Abomination of Women. But he had one woman in particular in mind, and that was Mary. And, and they called her Bloody Mary because she had, at least we documented, 500 Protestant pastors burned at the stake. So anyway, back to my story. Why, do we, why they needed this fear not? Ridley and Latimer, because they had preached so vociferously against Catholicism, uh, were arrested and burned at the stake exactly within three days of 446 years ago. They were burned on uh, October 16th, 1555. So they made a big deal out of these things because they were supposed to be deterrents, you know. So they parade them through the street as they're, they're heading to the place where they're going to do this. And uh, as you might imagine, uh, Ridley was kind of down in the mouth about this. He was a little upset. And so uh, Latimer turns to Ridley and he says this, Master Ridley, he says, Play the man, for we shall this day light a fire in England. 
that shall never go out. And it's still burning. And it never will go out. They needed that hand. Thomas Cranmer, like I say, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Mary beseeched him, she liked him, so she beseeched him to recant his Protestant faith. He wrote 16 letters of recantation. Each one he threw away. He couldn't send it. He couldn't send it. And finally, on the 16th one, he signed it and sent it. Recanting his Protestant faith. After sending it, he recanted his recantation and said, no, I cannot go back to Catholicism. So she says, fine, we will burn you also. So this was in March of uh, 1556 that he was burned at the stake. But here's the deal. Now, if you read about these martyrs, and, and if you're, you probably think, boy, I could never do what those guys did. But you could. And you can because I think what happens is at those moments, that's when God literally puts his hands on their shoulders and says, fear not, and gives them the strength and the power to endure. Now, here's what happened with Cranmer. You may think, well, he's a little cowardly, you know, 16 recantations, and he recants his recantations. And when they tied him to the stake, he requested that his arms remain loose. So they, that was okay. They tied him anyway and left him loose. And they, they piled the wood around there. And as the flames started to come up, he took his hand and he held it out into the flames. And he, because he said this was the hand that he recanted his faith with and he wanted it to burn first. And he held it there. That's the hand of God on those guys. Saying, fear not. So, here we are now in the 21st century and we don't have to worry about that stuff. Because we live here. But if we lived in other places, the church is still going through that same kind of stuff. You know? And God's still saying to them, fear not. Jesus has all the power. He's the first, he's the last, he's the almighty. This is the ultimate message of the book of Revelation. That no matter how bad it gets, no matter how much we struggle, Jesus is offering us the grace to deal with the things we struggle with from within, the peace of mind to deal with the things we struggle from without, and the guarantee that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. He indeed does have the whole world in his hands. Pray with me. Father, thank you that you are Almighty God. That you are the one that did indeed literally speak this whole thing into existence and you maintain it. Thank you, Lord, that when we fall short, when we suffer, when we struggle, when we have trials that we don't know why we're going through them, that you've promised us grace and peace to deal with those things. And Lord, you also have said that we are your ambassadors, so we are to extend that grace and peace to others. Help us to do that. Help us to deal graciously with those we disagree with. Help us to offer peace to those who might want to deal with us in hostility. Help us, O oh God, to reflect your true nature as we go through this life until that one day when we step into eternity with you and see you as you really are, our glorious God and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.